So folks, there is one question I want to ask, and this came from, you know, Jason was in New York and uh, we had uh, dinner together and I, I was going through John 1 verses 1 through 5 and I had him read the translation, Chinese translation to me. And there is one thing that really struck out to me. I, I wanted to ask him this also, and I will ask him this separately, but the concept of logos. The okay, concept of logos is central to the New Testament. And so I want to talk briefly about the concept and then ask the question, is there an equivalent of that in Chinese culture, Chinese thought, or there isn't anything? We keep only up to at this a Taoist level that, you know, Tao Te Ching and Analects. Is there, because there is a lot that develops after that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking only about Tao Te Ching and Analects. Uh, so let's try, I will I will do this and then I'm going to uh, ask David to add to anything about, you know, Logos itself. Because Logos, you know, again, again I'm not a biblical scholar. My understanding is very, very limited, but it looks like a very different concept to me than what is there in the Chinese, uh, in the Taoist corpus, as well as the Confucius corpus. And actually this discussion right now actually <laughs> reinforces that same position because like, you know, Tao Te Ching starts with saying that Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao and name that can be named is not the eternal name. Whereas the gospel of John starts by saying, in the beginning was the word. Similarly, the Indian corpus also starts with the beginning was the Om, mm. which is, you know, Om is actually, a, it, it's a sound, but it's a sound that captures the meaning of God, of beginning, middle, and end, and all those potentialities all captured in the sound. So it is really, I mean, both these, both the Indian corpus and the Western corpus. Now let's keep the Indian corpus aside because I don't want to make the discussion too broad. So we can just look at logos. Now I was looking at logos. I was reading Philo of Alexandria and his commentary on Genesis. Now he is a Jewish scholar who is Greek. And he was talking about logos as it ap appears in, the, in Genesis not about the New Testament. And there also it's very clear, you know, God spoke the world into existence. So speech word is core to the biblical corpus. And that's the logos. And it occupies not a minor position, but a central position in this corpus. So um, I want to, you know, I want to have David talk a little bit about logos. Uh, and then ask the question, is there anything like that? Or how is it different from ideas in Tao Te Ching and um, Analex? So David, if you could do the honors. Sure, I, I only have a few things to uh, add to the, the periphery, um, you know, which are going around the circle here. Uh, so Philo points out, Philo points out that um, the the six days of work, you know, up to the during the creation, all of the direct work that's explained is done in terms of the verb said. So it's all directly by some meaning, by language or however you want to interpret God said, whatever that means, and you know. The understanding of that is not like our speaking, of course, but it's analogous because it's the, the best we can get to understand it is in terms of things being brought about by their essential meaning. And, um, and, and it becomes speech the way we think of speech uh, on the sixth day when there are people and mankind is told to pronounce names for all of the animals and to thereby give them a clarity of their identity that, you know, for the human mind too. So humans name things. That's part of their work in creating is that they're clarifying, making essence specific for themselves in naming. And 
the last thing I'll add is the mystical twist on it. Uh, as you get deeper into the study and the exact creation language at the very beginning, the first couple words of the original text, Bereshit bara Adonai, Bereshit means literally at a head of, or not at, in the beginning, but in a, a beginning. Like this is what beginning is about. And the second word is creation, the word to, the verb to create. And the, the next word is the reference to God. And then comes the word, basically A to Z, the whole language, a, a kind of a word that doesn't have a translation, but it points to what comes after it as the direct object. The world, God created A to Z, the world. So it encompasses the idea that, you know, if you could express it in language, you'd grasp it this way. So it has to, I'd say, you know, mysticism entails taking the human spirit and trying to connect it to the cosmos. So it's it's a compromise if you're not exactly equal to the cosmos that you're trying to understand it. There's still two things involved. I don't know how to get any close to that, but for humans to understand it, the connection is this language thing. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David, uh, for that. Um, what I want to do is I want to briefly talk about uh, John 1, because this is New Testament version of that. You know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. So all things are made through him. It's very similar of the, the word. You know, everything is made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was light of men. Light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. So there is the idea of chaos, and there is this light coming in, and order, habitable order coming out of the word. So it's very much parallel to the, uh, to the Old Testament, uh, as best as I can see. And that's, again, the same thing I got when I looked at Philo or Philo, uh, whichever way I just pronounced, I couldn't figure it out yet. Um, but now you have this unit, okay, of logos and its central place. It's clearly a central place in the biblical corpus. By the way, the ohm is also operating the similar way. It's the primordial sound out of which all other sounds come and out of which everything else comes. So it's it's kind of analogous to it. But let's just focus on the logos. So the question is, how does this connect with Tao Te Ching? How does it connect with uh, Analex? Uh, is there any equivalent of it or is it something completely new? Um, so any thoughts uh, from, from anybody? Uh... I would like to say something. Please, please, Quan, uh, go ahead and take your time. Go ahead. I would like to say that uh, the Tao Te Ching is outstanding, of course, but I will cheat a little bit with your permission. It's the Ji the Ching is older than the Tao Te Ching, okay? And because this is older, I prefer to talk about the Analex and the Yi Ching. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Analex at uh, paragraph 2.4, uh, the answer is very clear. Okay, so I would like to remind uh, by memory what is paragraph 2.4, it's quite close, it's quite short. So it's the precisely the epistemological journey as described by Confucius using symbolic ages. So at 15, I devoted myself to learning. At 30, I took my stand in society. At 40, I am no more confused. That is the lower trigram. The upper trigram is that at 50, I am capable to hear the will of heaven. At 60, and 60 is my own free translation, but uh, it's close, okay? At 60, I am, I am capable to hear the will of heaven without complaining, but the exact translation is that my ear is attuned to the will of heaven. But I think that my translation is clearer, but that's my pretension. And at 70, uh, I'm capable to do what I want without breaking the universal laws, okay? So 
if we take the upper trigram, the fact that at 50, I'm beginning to be capable to hear the will of heaven, even with complain because I'm not ready, because I'm lazy, because I want to escape my duty, my heavenly duty, means that there is a logos, or there is a word of high principles that I am supposed to be capable to hear if I made the correctly the first three steps, meaning devote myself to learning, to take my stand in society and be no more confused. Because what is the meaning of being no more confused is that at 40, symbolically speaking, I'm capable to see that there is a time dimension or a becoming, to use Greek terminology, or doxa, or mimesis, and there is a timelessness dimension of being, or episteme, or uh, eidos, okay? We can use a Greek word that we love, or logos, precisely, okay? Uh, the, the, the domain of being, of principles uh, of uh, heaven, if you want. Uh, and here, I, I wanted to move the Tao Te Ching aside, not because it is not outstanding. I think it is an outstanding text, but uh, it's a, you know that Chinese, Chinese is a natural poetic language, okay? And among the classic, the Tao Te Ching is probably the most poetic of all of them. And you know perfectly that poetic words by contradiction, by paradoxes, by superpositions of layers of meanings and so on. That's why I'm pushing aside the Tao Te Ching, not because it's not good, on the contrary, it's too good, it, it takes too much explanation. And uh, the, the analects is simpler, okay? It states things as it is, as you go to a translation or if you're capable to learn Chinese or if you read Chinese, you wouldn't understand that everything I said is exact, okay? There is a time dimension and there's a timeless dimension which correspond to the logos. And uh, the, the, the I Ching precisely uh, show the lower trigram, which is the three lines broken or plane and the upper trigra trigram, the three lines broken up or plane with a space between the two, okay? Showing that there is a jump that you have to do to pass from time to timelessness. And in ancient China, of course, it was not entirely achieved, but there is a thesis, a, a metaphysical and social thesis that if you are in a true society, a, a right society, your epistemological growth corresponds exactly to your social station, okay? So at one, meaning I devote myself to learning, correspond to the common man, the common art. At two, that I am, uh, I, I take my stand in society, it would correspond to the petty officer. And when I'm no more confused, it corresponds to the officer. And when you are capable to make the jump, at, I am capable to begin to hear the will of heaven, even with complaint, it corresponds to the lords and the ministers. And when I'm capable to hear the will of heaven without complaining, because I'm completely prepared and willing to hear the will of heaven and to do what is needed to achieve the will of heaven, it corresponds to the king or the sovereign. And symbolically at 70, when I'm capable to do what I want without breaking the universal laws or without going outside the bounds, if I, I follow words by words, the bounds of what? The bounds of logos, of the, the heavenly will. Well, uh, it's the sage, okay? Or the philosopher king, if I use the Greek word. So I stop here. Wow, Quan, that was just wonderful. That was just wonderful. Um, it's actually very interesting um, in terms of, I mean, firstly, these two, you know, lower trigram and upper trigram, you know, this is like earth and heaven, uh, you know, heaven and earth or God and man. And it's all about, you know, really the New Testament is about bringing them together, uh, you know, heaven on earth uh, or 100% God and 100% man uh, is the same same kind of idea, which is, and the, but the, the interesting thing is that like the Greeks, when they talk about it, they talk about rising up, just like what, um, what Confucius is doing, that you have to start from 
the earth and you rise up to God. Exactly. But you, you, you know that India and the Euro European share the matrix of the proto-Indo-European. And you know that Zerz uh, means Zerz uh, Pita, I think. And I think in India you have Dios uh, Pater or something like that, meaning the heavenly father. Okay, But I think that all mankind share that. When we think to something superior, we will look up to the heaven, to the sky. <laughs> okay, I think it's very human. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the the slight twist is that there is in in New Testament God comes down uh, instead of us yeah. going up. God comes down so that we can go up. So it's it's a very but but it's the, the fundamental uh, the point that you're making is is very very good. It's excellent, excellent that you know you have the same kind of the the way in which the eternal. What you're saying is that the way in which eternal. I'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase what you're saying because you know you're coming from a very deep understanding of the Chinese thought especially in I Ching here it looks like this is I Ching where it is really there I mean it's kind of named in uh Analex but it seems to be coming from I Ching which is much absolutely um and so so it looks like that upper diagram is doing what the logos is supposed to do um, in in the um, you know in Indian con context or in the Western context, and the lower trigram uh, is doing what the Earth is supposed to do, and then there is some kind of relationship and dance that happens, uh, which is captured in a very different way in in this all all these hexagrams than than this one. So just just wonderful answer. Thank you, thank you uh, so Shukan, much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, to to add two things if we have time. Please. No, we have plenty of time. I want to hear what you have to say. Go ahead. In Chinese, uh, the, the graph for king, okay, Wang, is made of three vertical uh, horizontal lines with a vertical line uh, uniting them, okay? So the first horizontal line is the earth. The second one is the people, the humans, we. And the upper horizontal line is heaven. And the king is the man capable to unite the three, okay? But the king, uh, socially speaking, is a sovereign, of course. But if you understand the, the Yi Ching, the king is also the man having achieved his epistemological journey, okay? The man having been, having united, like Jesus Christ, his time dimension and his timelessness dimension. And, uh, and of course, it's a, it's a more democratic interpretation. In ancient China, that democratic interpretation was limited to the aristocracy, of course. But uh, the philosopher understood that meaning and they expanded step by step across, uh, through history to everyone. Uh, but I think that the process has been the same in India and the West, okay? In the, at the beginning, you have a, an aristocracy, and I would time it expanded. And the other thing that I want to add is that in the Yi Ching, there is a philosophical appendix called Shu Yi in Chinese, and it's translated as the ten wings. Okay, the like the wing of a bird. Okay, because it's ten chapters. Uh, according to Chinese tradition, it has been entirely written by Confucius, uh, but I think it's not true. It has been written by many authors. And Confucius gave the final version of it 25 centuries ago. And if you want the true understanding, the philosophical, the metaphysical, ontological, psychological, ethical understanding of the Yi Ching, uh, it's not by playing with the, the stuff uh, to have a prediction, because the Yi Ching is not a book for divination. The Yi Ching is an epistemological and uh, metaphysical book. I would say that the the five books and the uh, sorry the five classics and the four books in China are the exact equivalent of the Bible in the West. I stop here. Wow, wow, excellent. Um, I want to read my, my absolute favorite from Tao Te Ching. I'm sorry to bring back to Tao Te Ching because it's that's the one that I I've read most. Um, it's the twenty fifth chapter. 25th verse which talks about you know there is heaven earth there is man yeah. and the Tao 
uh, to me, I mean, as best as I understand, is the one that goes through. Uh, you know, so uh, the it's it's very very interesting that the fourfold um, you know uh, identification that you, that you made. Um, excellent. All right. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add? Uh, go ahead. Uh, any questions on uh, any thoughts about logos and uh, and Chinese philosophy, whether I Ching or Tao Te Ching or Analex? All right. Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I was going to say. I mean, uh, these are very distinct uh, ways of looking at the world, uh, but uh, one is more uh, explicit, obviously, the word um, and what Philo was looking for. And actually, we did a meetup about uh, with another group about three or four weeks ago on Philo. Uh, and he was looking for truth as a way of kind of understanding the universe. And so that was a, um, it's similar, and I've said this here before in the past, uh, that it's similar to the Tao in one regard, and it, it's similar but different. Uh, the Tao seeks to, uh, I, I would say, um, the the, the Dalai basically seeks to understand, like kind of, uh, it's like the nature of being, versus the idea where the logos and the word is seeking to understand nature itself. So, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think about how to best articulate this. Is that? Uh, That's it's more about okay. It's more about the natural order of things if you're talking about the Tao. But until you understand the natural order of things, you can't understand the order of nature. So I kind of see them as working together. So that that's what it, Philo actually kind of introduced in a way is that understanding the word and trying to explain the way the world works um, as a living universe was the best his best uh, attempt. For, for for explaining, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, cause and effect, everything, the, the source of everything. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I will make one comment and then uh, Quan. Um, I mean, one big difference that I see is that the way in which uh, the Chinese culture has captured it is highly visual. I mean, you can just see the tribe. Right. It, is, it is, you know, in, in visual terms. Uh, it is there in, in, that's consistent with the the script itself. Uh, so it's just being captured, like king being captured in, you know, written like that. Or the tri trigrams. Trigrams is the best example of that, capturing it in visual terms. The, the Bible captures it in audio terms. You know, it is spoken. It is written. Um, so that is a, is a giant difference between, between the two. In terms of what is it that is carrying the meaning, you know, the 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 speech versus versus the diagram versus the character. Um, thank you. Next up, is, uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Joe. I just say really quickly, I, if I remember correctly, when I uh, when Mark and uh, Mark and someone else pre uh, uh, had presented on the three spheres, he had actually talked about how. Um, it's uh, visually and actually even some of the names of things are from the Tao is you, how it's used in modern China. It's not explicit all the time, but that it's actually you know done visually as well. Uh, but I, I forget exactly what they were talking about. Thank you, uh, Quan. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I think that the distinction that you made is very interesting between the fact that it is said in phonet in, in sounds versus in images but uh, i would like to remind everyone that being sound or images what is at the center is the meaning okay in the sense that logos is first and foremost because let's not forget that in greek logos means 
a word, but also the principle. And you have another Greek word meaning the mutos, and mutos is more a story. Okay, so when we say logos in philosophy using the Greek word, it's much more about the principles, the meaning of the high principles. And what I, why I do, I say that that I would like to remind that either it passed by a sound or a, a visual representation. What is central here is the meaning of the higher principles, okay? Either logos or the will of heaven. That's one. And two, I would say that in the two civilization, uh, we can make uh, the division between uh, the political sciences, okay? Ethics, rhetorics, uh, politics, economics, and so on, and the natural sciences. And uh, I would say that uh, the percept because of the overbearing presence of the Confucianist, I would say that the Chinese civilization is more associated with uh, the political sciences rather than the natural sciences. But because of the tragedy that the Taoist corpus is not known enough, most of the time, because the uh, and here it's a Confucianist that is speaking, so we please bear with me. Uh, most of the time, Taoists in China means people who are a little bit uh, uh, escapist and not serious, okay? But uh, there is a true Taoism tradition uh, which devoted a lot of their effort to natural sciences. And uh, thanks God, there is a British who devoted uh, a lot of his life uh, to the exploration of that uh, natural sciences by the Taoists, the Chinese Taoists. And that guy is, you probably know him, Sri Khan, uh, is Joseph Nidam, okay? N-E-E-D-H-A-M for those who do, don't know Joseph Nidam, because uh, it's probably, his work is probably the most outstanding work uh, uh, existing in English language that will introduce you to the Leviathanist work of the so-called Taoist or natural sciences in China over the centuries. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I want to do just one thing and then hand it over to David. Um, the meaning of logos. I mean, word is not, doesn't fully capture uh, logos. So this is from the uh, the strong concordances. So I strongly recommend uh, the interlinear Bible. Um, so, so logos is a word as embodying an idea. It's a statement, a speech, a word, a speech, a divine utterance, an analogy. Um, it is speaking to a conclusion. It's a word of being an expression of thought. It is preeminently used of Christ expect, expressing the thoughts of the Father through the Spirit. It's a common term in regard to a person sharing a message. So it includes discourse, communication, speech. It is a broad term capturing reasoned, reasoning expressed by words. So it is meaning, it is structure, it is all of that. And what happens is that in original languages, you have these words which have all these connotations, all, all of this richness. And when there is translation, many times the full richness is lost. So you have to keep going back to the original language in order to pull all of that back because everything that is being said of logos actually depends on this rich rich background, rich meaning, and rich connotations uh, of that. Uh, David, go ahead. That's interesting. I was going to um, bring up that Heidegger examines the meaning of logos as one of his uh, early key points that he's making about how being is disclosed. And uh, it, this word essentially contains, as you said, the notion of dialogue. So it's intersubjective disclosure. So discourse was his choice of word, but it, it, it applies to self because you discourse to yourself about being and this way language uh, can come out of you. So it's internal disclosure of being as much as just using words. So that that's how we saw logos, how we develop our relationship to being and our thoughts in that way. So things become more complex and more layered 
because this is the way our, we function as spirits, as thinking beings, whatever we say. Uh, just because you mentioned that, but I was going to go back and mention old, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> whether there's an epistemology or whether there's a, um, how different the kind of teaching is from the Confucian, or maybe a lot of the Chinese texts we're looking at, the teaching, uh, as far as the Old Testament, literally itself, not auxiliary books, is a, a teaching, it's a revelation, it's a it's narrative, it's it's a recollection of events, it's memory and recounting of actions. It's a lot of action words, very little thinking words, almost no feeling words. I mean, uh, Abraham's told, don't feel bad that you have to send Hagara. It's about the feeling word, that's it. It's all the action, action, action. So, and th then these people arrive and they're treated this way and this is what, so uh, the meaning arises from the telling of it and it's impressing you and you're living with it and living with retelling. And you're not told this is what it means. You just live this narrative over and over until it's a real happening. And that's the way that teaching occurs in the Old Testament as opposed to developing principles or enumerating fundamentals. And these are the rules that, so uh, what epistemology comes out of that is, um, it's sort of each person is developing their view of events, which is not a uniform epistemology, right? And I think as you get to the medieval ages, the scholars are really concerned that we, we better organize this. So secondarily, these descendant texts are uh, created, derived by the sages, big smart guys. And uh, what's already developed before the medieval times uh, as as the temple's destroyed and history turns over, you can't live here anymore, you know, the state. So it's all become discussions and argument. So it becomes very much like uh, legal discussions, legal arguments, a vying and vying of ideas that is kept track of by people with awesome memories because it's their job and it's repeated over and over. And it, it's called the oral tradition. So there's the written and the oral. So there's vying of ideas and their opposites and how evidence is presented and how reasoning is used. Deductive logic, if not modus ponens, different rules, but deductive logic rules. Uh, like if this is repeated a second time, it must mean something additional. That's not a rule of standard logic, but that's a rule of how to understand law and events and text. So he did it again. That's something new. Don't think it's the same old thing. So that is that reasoning about what is a human and you're learning it from the retelling and the recounting then becomes a little more formalized because you've had a couple hundred years of teaching and teaching it. Finally, it does get written down. So the oral law is now a set of 13 big books. You know, It's the oral law, it's so bizarre. And, um, the, and then the medievals begin to lay out, well, here's the system. I'm going to reorganize and turn it into an alphabetical system. You, know, you can find things now. You want to remember women are referred to here and here and here and here. I'm going to make a chapter called women. So uh, maybe an epistemology has already evolved because the discussions lead you in a certain way. It's, uh, it's a different kind of system. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, David. A quick comment and then over to Quan. Um, this is just great because that's exactly what it is. Uh, you know, you have these stories and there are people looking through the stories and seeing the patterns. And it's very, it's really beautiful how like even God is talking to, uh, you know, Cain and saying, you know, if you did the right thing, would you not be the, or telling Jonah, is it, you know, does it, is it fitting for you to be this grumpy? You know, uh, so so. I, I, I don't. Yeah, you don't know if you have the whole story. Like, no, did you close the back door? You know, check. We don't have every detail, but I'm sure there's more that we don't know. <laughs> right. Uh, but it's 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 that, and it's layers and layers, and that's another thing about these all of these ideas. You know, we're discussing these books, but there are all these backstories of these books, and we need to get all of that in order to get the full richness of what it is. Because otherwise we are taking just one interpretation of it. There is just so much, there's just so much work that has been gone. You know, I'm going back and looking at these early church fathers and they're able to actually interact far more closely 
And we kind of say that, okay, now we are talking about this, but then you can see that, oh, this is origin, you know, this is the guy who actually said it. And then everybody kind of took that over that. And so it's, it's very interesting. It's like layers and layers of writing. And before that, there is layers and layers of speech that at some point got part of it, part of it got into writing. So thank you. Thank you, David, for making that point. Uh, Go ahead. A, la a last little speck I want to add, which is as you go back and things you haven't read yet and you realize, oh, that's exactly my thinking too. You realize how close you are to understanding in the ways that people already have been looking at these things. So it, it pulls you into that ancient understanding and modern understanding not that far apart if you're really you know are reading thoroughly yes no and what i find is that these rotations because i'm reading it many many times so what happens is that you read something and you figure something out and you go back to something that you have read and it is very different now it is it is so much richer and you're seeing these connections you know run through across across the lines just just incredible uh, thank you, David. Uh, Kwan. Okay, uh, I, I want to 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 react, but in a positive manner to what David just said, uh, because when you said revelation, okay, uh, it's very interesting because most of the time, uh, um, one of the wrong understanding of Chinese tradition that is a Chinese tradition is not a revelation tradition. It's wrong. Chinese tradition is the re revelation tradition because it is understood within the uh, six steps of epistemological development as uh, embedded within the main text of the Chinese uh, classics, the Jiqing. Okay, let's not forget the Jiqing is the oldest text of Chinese civilization, at least 3,000 years old, if not more. And it is uh, understood that those who reach to the number five, at least or number six stage of their personal adventure, will have a revelation from heaven, okay? And that is pr precisely the revelation of the order of things. So even if there's not someone that would go uh, to a mountain and receiving the tablets, uh, forgive me that I use that image, uh, it is a revelation given to you because you have the mind expanded to a space that is big enough to receive that heavenly understanding, that heavenly revelation. And the second point that I want to mention is that among the, the nine classic, or I would say according to the right manner, the four books and the five classics, the four books are manuals of epistemology except one, okay? But it's focused on epistemology, but it's not a manual, okay? You have three manuals, the Tasue, the Great Learning, the Chong Yong, the Doctrine of the Mean. Uh, well, I'm wrong, okay? There's two who are manuals, and there are two who are not manuals, but storytelling. Because in the Mencius, the 14 chapters are conversation of Mencius, the philosopher, with kings or princes of his time. Of course, it's a kind of manual, but at the same time, it's a storytelling because you have details of social interactions. And, and the Analex, <coughs> it's for and first and foremost, a storytelling about the role models that you can have. And in the Confucian school, it has been used as a, a series of role models that are offered to be discussed, okay? So it resembles a little bit to the story from the Bibles. And in the five classics, you have the Yi Ching. Of course, the Yi Ching is a very dry manual, which is more an epistemological manual and uh, I would say uh, epistemological considerations, okay? But if you take uh, the Shu Ching, okay, the book of documents, you have stories, you have storytellings like in the, the chapters of the Bible. If you take the Shu Ching, which is a book of songs or poems, you have storytellings in the poems. And now we have enough archaeological and historical uh, da data that we can relate each poem to a specific historical event. And I would say for almost the 305 poems in the book of songs. And you have the Chun Chu, the spring and autumn having three tra tradition, okay, three interpretative traditions. 
two of the two uh, two of the three uh, epistemological manuals, the Kuliang and the Kongyang tradition, but the Zhuang tradition is also a set of storytelling. So that's that's only what I want to say. Okay, that there is a in the West the the people who make the effort to study Confucianism. Uh, often they don't study this corpus in 100%, they would be introduced to what I call the more epistemological manuals dimension, except for the analects. But if you go into the five classic, it's essentially storytellings coming from the Concho legacy of the Chou dynasty, mm -hmm. a little bit like in the Bible, you have all kinds of, of, of stories coming from the historical period, let's say, uh, if we take the, the truly historical period, let's say uh, between uh, Abraham, okay, uh, 1800 BCE, uh, to the end of the Old Testament, would say uh, to the birth of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, even if before uh, Nemrod and those, those guys, we can relate maybe them to the Sumerian period too. So uh, there is a chronological framework at the background of those stories. And in China, you have the chronological framework of the Xia Shang Chou Dynasty at the background of the stories that you have in the Book of Songs, the Book of Documents, and the Spring and Autumn with the three traditions. I stop here. Thank you, Quan. Uh, great, great point. So I want to uh, go ahead, David, you're, you're first. Go ahead. So, Kwan, what I, what I was trying to say, I think we should have a discussion about this sometime. I don't know if now is a great way like, to think about it. But what I'm trying to say is that the Old Testament tradition is sort of deficient in not having a set of rules and any clear, I mean, the rules are about, you've got to burn this at this time. And, you know, uh, the people have to get together at this season and you have to pick the crops and bring stuff to the priesthood so that they can do it right. You know, it's it's not like, here's how to be good. We, no, like, it's not, it doesn't, um, uh, it tells you how to get divorced. You know what I mean? I, it doesn't, it, it doesn't tell you how to be a good husband. It doesn't tell you how to care for your children. It tells you the worst case of when you, the child is so bad that the kid might have to be put to death. I mean, it's it's really lacking in like, here's some big principles for your hold on. That whole idea of don't do it others until, you know, what you wouldn't want done to you is considered like, okay, if you don't read any of the Old Testament, at least take this. But that's not said until a thousand years later. That's not until the time of Jesus, practically, that the guy comes along and that becomes part of the tradition. There's so really lacking in that the, the old testament text i'm saying is sort of short on the here's wise it's strong on the do these but it's short on the, there is a like a here why is like well do all this stuff so that your days are long in the land whatever that means yeah but i'm not That's a scholar why. yeah i'm sorry not a, I, I, sorry to interrupt I'm not a scholar in Jewish studies, but I thought that the rabbi were there to give the interpretation and the explanation. So you have a, a written tradition in parallel with a oral tradition related to the temple, no? Let, let, let me uh, add one thing here. Uh, let me add just one thing. I'll give you the time frame and after Shikhan. Yeah. Um, I think the crucial thing, I mean, I want to defend uh, the Old Testament here. Um, huh. You have to understand the time frame of you know, some things which are older and, and things stand on the shoulders of things that are older. So if you, for example, go and read Rig Veda, which is the oldest of the Vedas, you will find it to be very similar, saying these are the rituals that you have to do. There is a lot of that. And like first time you read it, say, what, why, what, what is this? And then slowly, it's like and Julian James does a brilliant job of actually explaining it. It's kind of, it's basically birth of consciousness. It is people trying to figure out different things. You start in a concrete way. You say, okay, these people did this, these people did this, this is what happened to them. And then you slowly move to from 
external action to internal action. So if you look at Old Testament and New Testament, the big difference, big um, step is everything gets internalized. You know, it moves from laws, you know, Moses gave laws, but grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. So it is like internalized. Everything becomes internalized and conceptualized um, later. You can see the difference between the earlier parts of the Old Testament, like Amos, for example, and later parts mm -hmm. like Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastics is far more sophisticated about what is going on in your mind and how will you perceive things and how you will be wrong about it. It's very much conscious of what is going on in the mind. Amos is not. So there is there is this entire uh, thing. So it's partly you have to respect that, you know, we've learned things over time uh, and we are talking about from a context, actually not even, like even Greeks would say, uh, Greeks are far more, um, you know, classical Greek period with Plato and far more conscious of thinking about things. So there, when you're looking at something that is older, it will have a different character. And that is there in, um, I don't know enough about the Chinese corpus. Certainly that is there in, um, in the Indian corpus. Uh, then again, I want to point out one, make point one about oh, one more point about stories. Stories are the form in which those initial things are presented. Uh, so there is, and then people later on kind of build in morals, and then you continue to use stories uh, even later on. Uh, but you get some explicit conceptual guidance, you know, moral guidance uh, later on. Um, okay, I don't know, Quan or uh, David, who are David? David, you're you're next. Go ahead. It's stories and a little bit of picture writing because the language is quasi hieroglyphic. The ancient, uh, you know, symbols are very, they're almost little pictograms too. Like the mum is the sound, is the water shape, you know, it's like it's derived very close to uh, the, the hieroglyph shapes. Um, so the chronology, Juan, just so you, you got it. So let's say 1800 uh, BC, you know, is the sort of the, rudimentary beginning and then Abraham uh, shortly after that. And so it's all recollections from what that family was like that are told and written down maybe around 1300 BC, which is, would be the first couple books, which is Moses' legacy is the first five books. And that is a period of uh, just being a small tribe, going down to Egypt and coming out and then kind of going into be nation building. That's from 1000 BC, the kingdoms built, and they're thrown out by 586. The Assyrians run them out, and then they come back, and then there's this second temple built, and they survive there until about 70 when they're knocked out by the Romans. So just, it was before, up to that point, it's been like priests and kings, and priests and kings, and the sages, the wise ones, Right, are helping the priestly class do their stuff, but they don't have authority. The people with authority from the Old Testament are the people born into the clan of maintaining the cult. And that's the uh, family of Moses and Abraham, Levites, and the high brothers of those who do the fire pans and sacrifices, the Kohans, because that's what a priest is. But they're just part of that family, the Levites. That group loses authority as the nation breaks down and it becomes a culture of thinking and transmitting verbally and arguing legalistically. And that's when rabbis, ra rav means big. That's when the big brains come in, which is you know anywhere from, uh, by 200, they've sort of canonized, we need this to survive. If we don't have a land anymore or a temple and we're still, having the same life. We have to act like we have a temple every day, three times we get together, let's talk about it. And that's what services are. So it's the re recapturing the presence that you used to have as words and the whole legalistic thing, living that way becomes your law system. And so by 800, they not only have that 200 AD legalized system, but the full read discussion of why did you choose that law and who taught that way and what are we going to do so the talmud is ready by 800 a.d and it's become this large you know 
tradition as though that is steady, but it's a di it's a dialectic dynamic thing. And, you know, so around those fixed laws, the son-in-laws interpret, well, what did, did father-in-law Rashi, what did he mean by that? Oh, well, you know, he thought the girls had to agree when they were married. So we have to go with his opinion and then you know, on and on from there. But there's this clinging tradition that I think is common in a lot of organizations and religions that we have the truth because we're the rabbis still. Oh, but there's another branch of rabbis who also are saying that. So there you have little schismatic and historic, you begin to have the development of the cultural views of uh, what is the heart of the Judaism, but we agree on these things. And then it, that becomes the melee it is today, you know, but uh, very cool. excellent. I, I want to add one thing. This is just beautiful. Um, I want to add one thing, and that is about the word revelation. Um, you know, revelation is my, my bad choice. I'm sorry, teaching. No, no, that's good. very good. That's very good because it's revelation, it is apocalypse, and people really don't get it because it's simply unveiling. It is the divine and the earth, it is removing the 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 thing that is between so you can showing. see directly what's that showing it's the evidence yeah, yeah. it is showing it is it is illuminating it is uh it is bringing light you know the life was the light of men it is um it is the rending of the temple or uh, the the curtain of the temple with with the cross when I mean, that's it's it's basically making the the <clears throat> eternal ideas accessible to anybody who wants it without an intermediary, without a temple, you know, you are the temple, you know, yeah. it's not, uh, so, so that, that is the idea and that is the progression. Um, you know, initially it is like, okay, you can suddenly, you know, some few people may get some glimpses of the divine somewhere. And then these are the prophets and, you know, you just listen to them. You typically kill them. That's what ends up happening with most, most of the prophets, but, um, uh, sometimes you know they will get you know they will have laws which are there but anyway the the the, the line is very thin the connection is very thin and very intermediate intermittent and this is all about you know making it accessible Quan, go ahead um yes i would like to say something before i forget okay there is a word in chinese that i think that after jun run jun zi are the two first and the third one should be shun run okay shun Run is the sage with the capital S, okay, the guy uh, having achieved the epistemological uh, journey. And Shun is written with an ear, meaning he's capable to hear the wind of heaven, with a mouth, meaning that he's capable to say it to his fellow being, uh, human beings. And the last uh, graph just under is the, the simplified image of a gentleman in court, uh, in robe at the court, okay? Meaning that uh, because in Chinese uh, mentality is always related to the government, but meaning someone who has achieved his epistemological development, okay? Because once again, it's go back to the fact that you are capable to hear the will of heaven, okay? And uh, so the number six in Chinese is called a shandran, and the number five is called a chunzi, and the the uh, and the cardinal uh, quality of a chunzi is precisely a run, and the cardinal quality of a shun run is chu. But uh, here is something very interesting. Chu meaning wisdom at the number six is written with uh, uh, okay. There are three elements. Okay, one of the elements mean an arrow. The other element means a mouth, meaning that you are capable physically and intellectually. But at the wisdom, you have the sun just under. Okay, so you are a capable human being, but enlightened with the presence of the will of heaven, of the sun. And if you remove the sun, it's also pronounced Ju, but it's not wisdom, it's intellect. Okay, and intellect is number two. So, once again, there is a revelation by the son of the absolute, and here I use Greek terminology and not Chinese terminology, but let's say by the Tao, if you achieve your journey. And I wouldn't uh, take another five seconds and relate it to what uh, both David and Srikan said. Uh, the Chinese, 
it's accepted nowadays that the writing system of the Chinese started around 1300 BCE, okay? And in th around 300, a little bit like what you said, David, there was a ritual reforms by a king called Mu, okay? The King Mu or Mu Wang. What I want to say by those two uh, years is that between 1300 BC and 800 BC, you have 500 years or uh, about uh, uh, 20 generations, okay? If you accept four generations by century. It means that it took about 20 generations from the moment the Chinese know how to write, meaning to put stuff on a physical uh, support to, to remember, to the moment that uh, they are capable to have a meta representation of what they are doing. Okay, a little bit like in India, the Rig Veda would say you you do that ritual and blah blah blah, and it took and the Rig Veda is around a thousand three hundred BCE too, I think, in terms of writing. Maybe in the tradition is older, but in terms of the written documents, okay, it's around a thousand three hundred BCE too, and in eight hundred BCE, what happened in India? The Upanishad. Okay, nine hundred BCE for eight hundred BCE. So it took about five centuries for the engines to go from ritual to a meta representation of what the ritual mm. means. And in the Chinese, uh, three centuries later in 500 BC, so at the time of Confucius, there was a guy, an, an aristocrat in the principality of Zheng named Zhu Chan, and he was a hero for Confucius, who decided to put the written laws cast in bronze vessel that would be exposed in public so everyone could read them. So it took another 12 generations that people understand that having the meta representation, the why, so that the aristocrat having the power, well, the best of them, decided that everyone should be capable to read the laws so they would not be trapped. I stop here. Wow. Thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This this is really the the you know I I love this because you have to understand all of these progressions because it is the layers and layers. You know, it's like human achievement is built on all these layers, and you kind you have to and when you understand the layers beneath the layers that you are focused on, you see that the energy that is you know coming from there, and you you fully appreciate um, what you have. All right, uh, folks. So this was just uh, wonderful. A any further comments, uh, David? You you good? Uh, I do. I have one little side question. Please, for uh, David, yeah. love to hear it from you. Just go ahead, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, yeah, because the in a sense the original narratives are just narratives, and then it's left to interpretation. What you end up with is a constant disagreement. There's always disagreement. So even the most enlightened, the biggest rabbis, they're known because they're arguing against somebody else who's equally big. So it's like, well, he's right, but you know, and then this is other side, and they're they're, they're always this against against. So you can sort of see sides of an equation, and you know which one is the primary, or why is it being looked at this? It's just that kind of thing happen as you know is there kind of a back and forth tradition at all in the uh, chinese text oh yes oh yes because uh, uh well that's that's the branch of we call hermeneutics okay because in epistemology as you know you have the theory of knowledge the heuristics and the hermeneutics okay meaning uh, what is the meaning related to practical human life okay and that hermeneutics uh, during the, let's say, if we start from the time of Confucius around 500 BC to now, during those 25 centuries, you always have a, a coming back to the Yi Qing, to the Su Yi, the Ten Wings, uh, to the poems of uh, the Book of Songs, to the stories of the Book of Documents, of the Chun Chu, okay, especially the three tradition, the Zhou Chuang, the storytelling, the Ku Liang, the more, more ritualistic tradition of the Kong Yang, the universal history tradition, okay? So that hermeneutic traditions and philological tradition, because philology is a technical branch of hermeneutics, okay? Because you have to be sure 
what is the meaning of that word at that time, okay, to give an interpretation. So philology and hermeneutics uh, is at the center of a, a Chinese scholar life. In okay. terms of political science, okay, in terms of political science, I'm not speaking of the natural science. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the Bible and I'm seeing so much of that, you know, and there are, there are giants there. You know, you have uh, people like Origen who's kind of saying, okay, there are these various ways of doing it. There is, you know, Philo of Alexandria, just saying, same text. Now let me see, look at it allegorically and show you what, what that can get. And you get something completely different at a much deeper level as a result of that. And then there are people, um, the, uh, the then if you put one more layer on this, this is definitely, uh, you know, unique to Bible. You know, it's like you have people, there are actually three different traditions in the early times. You know, there is a Judaic tradition. There is the Hebrew text there. There is the Greek tradition. And then there is the Roman tradition that comes after that. And what we have, some of it is sitting on the Roman tradition and some of it is not sitting on the Roman tradition. Some of the Hebrew that is coming to us coming is coming through the Greek tradition and Roman tradition on the top of it. Some of it is coming directly. So you kind of have to... And, the way in which people are interpreting it, um, it's it's completely different based on so the philology of actually looking at these translations and looking at why was this translation done? You know, who did it? And who, uh, what is the difference between the Greek sensibility and the Roman sensibility? So when you translate something which is originally in Greek in Latin, what does it do to it? Because it does things to it. And certain things get focused on, certain things get um, uh, de-emphasized. So that's another thing on the, on the I don't know, uh, David, what do you think about these these three three different languages? Um, well, there, there are several languages. I'm more familiar with the Jewish tradition. So um, after being uh, sort of expelled out of their land and coming back, it turns out that they weren't familiar with the old writing anymore. So they took on a whole different alphabet. And the alphabet you see today for Hebrew is not the you know, original alphabet. It's the Ashuric alphabet from basically Assyria, which they adopted. So it's like writing Yiddish is like writing German in Hebrew characters. It's, you would think you hear it, you think you're hearing German and you look at it and it's like Hebrew characters. What's happening? Well, this is what happened to the Hebrew that you know, everyone uses nowadays, people just don't read the old stuff anymore. But yeah, it, it, uh, the sounds are different because you moved and came back and pronounced differently and the meaning is carried in the sound, as you know. So it's very much changes the way you hear the intent. Uh, and, and as Guan was saying, you know, going back to what was that word really getting at, you know, and, and how connected are these two words that are so similar but they're now they're not because i'm using a different alphabet you know tahara and tahor tahara is uh becoming you know hara becoming pregnant and tahara becoming pure so i mean you you tahara which is it is it you've been purified or you've had a birth so these are really different things because you become defiled when you give birth for a while you have to become purified again you know in those systems so yeah it, it what is your attitude towards human life at that moment and so going back to the text and doing hermeneutics or looking for the openings again there's always more that can come out of it so it's a constant found it's a source forever so i think the texts are looked at that way as though it was created in such a manner that everything can be derived from but you know it's also if you look at a you know within an atom it reflects everything in the universe back out of it too so this is part of that way of looking at things and incorporating the idea that your reflection and the thing you're looking at are entangled right all right, I want to close with a kind of a lighter note on translation. Um, there's This is from the preface to Martin Buber's work by Walter Kaufman. Uh, you know, he has this great book, uh, I, Thou, uh, I and Thou. Uh, and uh, Walter Kaufman, uh, his translator writes, he says, 
you know, Martin Buber, when he moved to Israel, learned Hebrew and started writing in Hebrew, but he could never master Hebrew because he could never write as complicated, very difficult to understand things in Hebrew as he normally did in, in German. So uh, it's, um, so I, I thought that was really, really interesting. You, you would not want to write feeling language and yet the poetry is beautiful. So yeah, it, it we we can't force it into a different bottle, I guess, right? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Um, so Quan and uh, David, this was uh, and Joe and the LJ. Uh, thank you for sticking by. This is just incredible conversation. It's very rare to get an opportunity to do this this level of uh, conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you thank to you. Guys. That's the magic of Zoom. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Joe. Yeah. You'll you'll post it. You'll post this, right? I will post this. Yeah, I'll I'll post this as a separate uh, piece. I'll I'll do the I'll separate it out. The That'd be great. And this one. So um, I think I think this is very very good. All right, see you folks. Yeah, Bye. this will be good. Ciao. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.